We've got our first ever guest. We have. And which is exciting. It's, yeah, it is exciting, actually. I'm slightly nervous. Not for me, for the guest, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's a it's an absolute honour to be here. So, everybody watching and listening, this is John Robbins. Hello. John has a YouTube channel, which we're going to discuss, but it's mm-hmm. not really your main kind of profession. Let's say I get to the golf course and I get teed up with you. Yep. We go and play the first hole. After the first hole, I go, by the way, John, what is it you do? How would you answer that? I'm a comedian and radio presenter, Ooh. I would say. Okay, so then yeah. I'd be thinking... I'm guessing you typically get tell us a joke and all that. Well, the fact is, I mean, that you've had to ask what it is I do shows (laughs) sort of how successful I am in both of those worlds. (laughs) So we've played a whole hole of golf. You're thinking, who's that guy? (laughs) It wasn't that funny. (laughs) So comedian, radio presenter. Yeah. And golfer. Bad golfer. Bad golfer. That's crucial. Because that's the name of your YouTube channel. Yeah, the channel's called Bad Golf. And it's uh, some. It's a channel I run with Alex Horn, who you might know from Taskmaster, oh, the comedian, comedian, the, real- <laughs> <laughs> the funny guy, <laughs> the recognisable TV I presence. I know Alex that Horn. one. Oh, you should have said. And uh, also from the Horn section and um, his own uh, his various projects. But uh, yeah, about three years ago, I moved uh, out of London from Bristol originally, but I moved out of London and I got a text. And Alex, Alex lives in the next town along, and he said. Uh, you play golf, don't you? And I was like, I think I could probably dust off the clubs. <laughs> he said, I'm going, I go to Portugal every year to play golf with um, my brother-in-law's mates. And I was like, I'm not sure I won't. I think I'd be too scared and embarrassed to do this. And I just thought, oh, go on, you like golf. J- go to Portugal. Yeah. It'd, be, it'd be crazy. Why not? So we go and I'm terrified because there's, I think, 16 of us at the time. Didn't know anyone apart from Alex. And it was just the best three days I'd had in such a long time. And I was awful. And, but the, like I played awfully, but it's so much fun. Everyone was really lovely. And it's a thing called the Murray Cup, which is basically a Ryder Cup format between two teams. And I'd always been obsessed with the Ryder Cup. And then when we got back, me and Alex, we were looking forward to next year going on the, so we decided to try and play a bit in between. Mm -hmm. And then the next year we went and we were still awful. And we thought, well, let's just film the rounds because we were really getting into a lot of uh, golf YouTube videos, staying up way too late, watching endless, endless people we didn't know playing golf in various ways. And um, we just, as much as we enjoyed all of it and uh, none more so than your own, there was no one who was as bad as us. (laughs) So we kind of wanted to represent what we felt were the majority of people's experience of playing golf. So to put that in some level of score handicap, what what, we, what well, are you classifying as bad golf? I listened to your podcast episode called Bad Golf. Oh, yeah? Uh, about why you quit trying to um, <laughs> play on the tour. Yes. And I thought... It when was, you realised. <laughs> yeah, when I realised I wasn't good enough. And I thought it was incredibly honest of you. And I was sort of really feeling for you as I listened and then you named the score and you scored um I can't remember what it was 88 eight, eight, 89. 89 89 it was 18 over 88 okay, yeah. don't rub it, it in <laughs> that's enough so um, after all of this I was feeling for you I was thinking how devastating it must have been so embarrassing and you named the score 18 over and I thought hang on and I checked through all my scores I've played probably 75 rounds of golf since I got back into it two or three years ago my best ever score, the pinnacle of my achievement, is 18 over. Okay. That was, personally, I was on my own. That was the happiest I've ever been on a golf course. <laughs> and it made me want to quit. Adding up, and I was, uh, it was 87. It's the only time I've ever broken 90, but it didn't quite count because it was a par 69. Okay. So it was 18 over. And since then, that was, a, that was about eight months ago. I've never got close. Okay. So it was, that is the divide. Okay, yeah. And you said that that was your worst ever round. Yeah. So I went back and found my worst ever round. I played the Oxfordshire. Nice course. Yeah. And we don't often get to play really challenging courses. We played local ones, which are sort of past 69, past 70, quite short Parkland courses. Um, On the Oxfordshire, I I actually have to do the maths in my head. (laughs) Um, So I was... 
65 shots for the first nine holes. <laughs> okay, that's so a lot. 20, 23 over for okay. the first nine. Solid. And, Canters for the back nine. Uh, 62 uh, shots for the back nine. Well, so it, was, it was better. Shot 127. And I was with three mates. It was Alex and two other friends. This was not filmed. Thank the Lord. And um, so, yeah, I think I was uh, 55 over. And that was sort of my version of your 18 over. Yeah. 55 over. And I remember thinking, I looked back at the, the card, I had 21 bunker shots in six bunkers. <laughs> oh, my word. <laughs> and the, I remember... You went to the beach. You didn't go and play golf. And I'm on this, <laughs> I'm on this beautiful course... I'd never played a course like manicured like really that and designed nice. like that before. And it is a hard course for a for a bad golfer. But I remember thinking, are you going to enjoy golf for the rest of your life, which is something you want to play golf? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to let this sort of thing just completely crush you and you put your clubs away and you never do it again? And I sort of made a decision that day that as much as I might F and blind and just get so down on myself on the course, I'm all. I'm always going to keep playing, mm -hmm. and um, so we we started filming the channel, and it is just us playing golf very badly, nice. but hopefully, enjoying it and showing people that golf is for people who play golf badly, and most people play bad golf most of the time, and I think a lot of people are put off by embarrassment especially, you know, the sort of old image of the golf club where, you know, there's rules and etiquette and pace of play and, you know, all those things are, mm. are important. But you should also feel that if I hit it out of bounds off the first tee or it doesn't go over the front tee box, I'm still welcome here because everyone has hit that shot and everyone starts off bad. Yeah. No one picks up a club when they first play golf and just hits an absolute kind of stinger. Exactly. 190 yards. For sure. And I think what you said then, though, on Rick's bad golf was your good golf. Yeah. Some of your, what you class now yourself as a, as a bad golfer, but some of your all right golf would be some other golfers, amazing golf. And that's what's quite unique with the sport, that you, with the handicap system. Mm. People can play, you mm. can mix different abilities and have quite competitive matches. Um, but what I wanted to start with a little bit more was how did you, so you, you obviously got the clubs back out a few years ago, mm. but how did you start playing golf? Because I think we, me and Rick have very similar stories to how we started, but I'd be very interested to hear how you started and what oh, got well, you into it. Well, I came to golf really quite late. I was, I remember going to a driving range with Cubs and basically it was a way of them just getting us out of their hair for mm. half an hour and we'd all line up with a battered old seven iron and we just kind of, it, you, the sound of balls hitting. <laughs> those, yeah, just, yeah, it was dangerous. You had to go and with a helmet. The tee that's this high and yeah. a yeah, yeah. And um, the problem was, which is a problem that is still at the core of my golf today, is that I couldn't work out whether I played golf right or left-handed. Um, I'm right-handed okay. in everything I do, apart from golf and batting at cricket. Right. I haven't played cricket for a long time. but So I, a friend of my mum's bought me some lessons, probably when I was 11 or 12, and the guy said, well, you need to decide whether you're right or left-handed and played a few shots right. I was playing right-handed at the time. And it just, I was like, A, the cost of the clubs was way beyond what m my mum could afford and what I could afford. Also, I wasn't really sure whether I was right or left-handed. You couldn't, I didn't know anyone who played golf, so I concentrated on cricket. And um, the guy who coached me, I, I was like, Look, I can play right or left-handed, which should I do? He he'd put a bat on the floor. He said, pick up the bat, and I picked it up, and he said, you're left-handed. Yeah. Just because of the way I picked it up. Now, the problem that that's brought me right up until a lesson I had two weeks ago is that my st strongest arm is my right arm. I've got no bottom hand. I don't get through. I pull out shots, and it's because I'm using my body to try and pull the club mm -hmm. through, so I'm not there's no pivot. It's, I'm basically playing a forward defensive every okay, time yeah. I hit a golf ball. Okay, yeah. that, that's often the case with cricket players as well. They'll... they'll transcend their skill from a cricket bat into a golf mm. club and it doesn't always particularly work because the skill is obviously so Absolutely. different. And I was always a back foot cricketer anyway. Yeah. So I'm used to kind of, I mean, I'm making a motion here, but you can't see it if you listen to the podcast, but I'm kind of, anyone who's ever stood up on a golf shot will mm. know what I'm doing. Yeah, my, yeah. my right, your left shoulder is coming up and I'm sort of pushing my chest out and that's still a problem in my swing. So... 
you were saying about like my all right golf being some people's amazing mm. golf. It's true, but I still have the capacity to play a shot that if you saw me, you'd think he's never picked up a club before. <laughs> and it's that's the, I'm at that frustrating point well, where I I can hit I I hit a drive on the last mm. the best this is the best shot I ever hit in my life on the last trip to Portugal we have longest drive competition yeah. I never get anywhere near the longest <laughs> drive competition I I don't think about the longest drive competition because they're all they're proper big boys <laughs> the, big, the big boys they are big boys. big boys <laughs> and we were at uh, Amanduera and, I played um, there yeah I saw, saw your video shared, shared it to my team but not Amanduera the other team is <laughs> it is so they've got this raised uh, fairway it's maybe 130 yards from the tee suddenly you've got this sort of island fairway and they said, oh, this is the longest drive home. I turned to the guy. I was like, what the hell are they made this? The longest, it's impossible to get on the fairway. No one's, and I teed it up really high. And you might have to bleep this and apologies. But I said, in my head, I went, what a fucking stupid place to hit, have a longest drive. I hit the ball 299 yards straight, 40 yards past the longest drive. No way. And it's the only time ever I've hit a drive where it just felt like I wasn't moving at all. And there was no ball, and it just went. And there's one. I'm watching this in slow motion now. Oh, it mate! <laughs> I could not believe it. And they're all watching from the bar area. And the only group left, the only person who could beat me, was the scratch golfer who's on the tour. Everyone else is above scratch, by quite a way. And he hit it so far it went over the fairway, so he <laughs> it was invalid. Yeah, so he hit it like 320 yards. I won it. I won oh the longest God. drive competition. And um, but. You know, next one, it's, you know, it's, gone, it's gone 15 yeah. yards. <laughs> well, it, you know, it averages out quite well. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So you've got to work it out. If you get hit 300 yards and next one 100 yards, it, you hit both drives 200 yards. So, I think uh, it's interesting. Sorry, just a quick, uh, interesting what you said about the left-handed, right-handed. Because a lot of players are like that. Mm. Phil Mickelson is a right-handed person. He plays all of his golf left-handed. But obviously, he's played from such a young age. He's mm. become so used to that where you come into it, an 11-year-old and when you were 11, did you play a lot of golf in in your younger years? No. So I I didn't play an actual round of golf until I was probably... Uh, the girl I was going out with at the time, her dad played golf. And I said, oh, I, I'll, give that, I'll give that a go. So I bought a set of clubs. I would have been 20... The first set of clubs I had, I was 20... I've been 23. Okay. So that's pretty late then. Yeah. It was a Max Fly starter set from... Um, uh, well, it is now Jamie Sports or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. And um, I played with them, I pl maybe played six times with her dad and his mate and uh, hit some good shots. Yeah, yeah. With no, and then me and my friends started going on a pitch and putt in Bristol at a place called Ashton Court. And you'd hire out your seven iron and your putter and you'd go around. And I really started to love it. And it was that one shot Maybe every twenty, mm -hmm. you back. like, hang on, that's yeah. that sort of shot of golf, a short sort of shot of golf would hit. Yeah. So then I went to get a lesson, and I'd love to see my swing at the time. It was like this. Um, I can't, I can't really describe you're it. Like but a, you're <laughs> like a, a one of those, uh, uh, not wombles, but those things that like wobble head, a bubble, yeah. what they call. No, like you can like flick it over, and it never, it never oh, actually yeah. falls over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A wimble, or I can't remember <laughs> they call them now, like a kid's toy. So then the guy starts saying, "Well, you actually need to turn your body. You have to move your shoulders around." And I was sort of doing, you know, this like almost like a dance. Guys, if you are listening to this on the podcast, make sure you go and check the out the video, <laughs> the video on YouTube of John's action currently because it it looks nothing like a golf swing right now. What you what no, you're showing me? No, it was sort of, <laughs> and um, my head would go right up at the end. Um, and then, so since then, I would I would go to the driving range and I would uh, I'd get some lessons. But it wasn't until this trip to Portugal. So I've only actually I would say I've only actually been playing golf for about three years, and I'm 37. So I don't have that. The thing I'm most jealous of of people who, no matter what their score, they just got a natural swing because it's they've been doing it since they were yeah, six kids. or seven or eight. Yeah, or exactly. So I'll never have that. You know what I'm really interested to explore a little bit is, and we said this before before you got here, I was chatting to Rick on the phone, was that, so you're a self-confessed bad golfer, and what would mm. your handicap be about? Mine's 23. 23. So, so, you know, if I went out now and shot 82, for example, that for me would be bad golf. But obviously, I'm guessing for your handicap, that would be like amazing. That might be, but, when I, 
I'm on my deathbed. That may well be the best shot I, but the best score I ever hit in my life. 82. 82. What I wouldn't give. Honestly, I would cry if I hit 82. I would feel such pride and such achievement if I could hit 82. But How long it, do you think it'd last though until you wanted to try exactly, and beat it again? Exactly. That is the thing. In, I think it's actually, I, I am so fixated on breaking 90 that it's become a problem. It's in my head. So if I hit a bad shot, if I hit a ball out of bounds, because I, I, I play quite a lot on my own because I've got free time in the day because my work is in the evening. So I prep and I plan and I watch videos and I try not to worry about swing stuff, but I'm like, it's mentality is course management. And I'm gonna treat every hole like it's bogey, is par. Mm. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna be so disciplined. And I'll, I shank it off the first tee, and I'm like, well, that's the whole round gone then. <laughs> yeah. And I feel then that sort of, oh, well, there's no point. So I do silly stuff. I don't line up putts. Yeah. I, I play lose shots. Interest. It's not that I lose interest. It's that I play shots I should never play. So I'm s- suddenly in a bad situation short-sided over a bank bunker and I'll play a flop shot. A, a yeah. shot which I have never played. Well, I think this is a clear flop shot. I'm just going to flop it up, flop it down, be about two feet from the hole. So you start to get reckless. And what I'm really interested in is the sort of... Because, you know, equipment and practice and lessons and technique is really important, but I'm really interested in how much difference someone can make by how they approach a hole for whatever skill set they've got, for shot choice, for how you um, sort of plot out a hole, for how you control your head for three and a half, four and a half hours. There's a really good bit, which I'm sure you remember from Golf is Not a Game of Perfect, where Tom Kite's playing with a load of um, like college oh, yeah. golfers. Yeah. And they're all playing brilliantly, and they say to him, we hit the same shots you hit. Why are you Tom Kite and why are we just sort of, you know, borderline pros? And yeah. he says, you will have four lapses of concentration on a round of golf mm-hmm. and I won't. Yeah, exactly. And those four lapses of concentration will cost you maybe seven or eight shots. I won't have those lapses of concentration. And that blew my mind. Because I think, and there's another YouTube channel I really like called Golf Sidekick, who's very much... Mm-hmm. It's not about the equipment. It's not about how much money you management. spend. He's yeah. good. He's really good. I like he's, his channel. He's great. And he, it's sort of very inclusive because he's saying, look, whether you're trying to break 100 or 90 or 80 or 70 or whatever, there's a mental side of the game which can have so much more influence on your score than like the equipment side. And I think that it's in the interest of golf equipment companies and in the, in the interest of the PGA to make you think you're terrible at this sport and that you can get better by spending money. You think it's a marketing? Well, you know, I got a new set of clubs recently and they are better than my old set of clubs and I prefer using them and I play better. Alex, I think we started on Alex, got a second-hand set of paying irons. He's dropped eight shots just because his clubs fit. Right, okay. And he's got a new putter and, it's, and it is infuriating because this we worked out our handicaps and I was <laughs> three shots ahead of him. So he's got three shots of me now. He's playing eight shots better than me. Wow. His handicap is going through the floor. It's incredible. And that is definitely down to the fact, you know, he didn't spend a lot of money. Maybe he spent 250 quid on a second-hand yeah. set of ping irons. But there is definitely an industry in making people hate golf. It's a weird irony that you're out on the course, livid at yourself, so you try and spend your way out of that um, whole rather than think maybe it's the fact that I am angry on a golf course mm-hmm. and I am tense and I am want I want to destroy this ball <laughs> I want to hit this ball so hard that it just explodes whereas actually you know if you and I'm terrible at this as you anyone who's seen our videos will know but if you just try and keep calm and enjoy it and keep loose and think right that was a terrible shot, but the next one might be the best shot I ever played. So I'm going to say two things here that a little bit might not make sense at the start and a little bit controversial. I honestly believe, and this again might sound silly, if you can break 100, you can break 90. Because to break 100, you have to have some level of golfing prowess. You have to be able to hit the ball, decent distance, and relatively, you know, 
all right. We did a little video the other day on Facebook. So if anyone's listening or watching and wants free daily golf tips, head to the Rick Shields Golf Facebook page. It's where we post them all. And it was about how to break 90, a little, little clip. And Rick put a golf ball in a furry bunker, par five. So let's just say you're playing and your, your tee shot on a par five has gone into the fairway bunker. Happy I'll, with that. Yeah, <laughs> a, a lot of you know bad golfers or people that want to break 90 or whatever it might be would look at that and, and maybe try and just hit it out or not really think about it. Whereas we actually took a step back and said, well, don't try and just get it out with a seven iron because there's a lip there. Now, it's not a massive lip, but the chances are a, you know, a, a bad golfer. I keep using that phrase, but you know what I mean. The bad golfer. We're allowed to use it with giant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You've got to embrace that phrase. <laughs> yeah, a bad golfer might try and hit a seven iron and just clip it out. But actually, if you can look at the look at the bunker and think, well, if I place out backwards or even sideways where there's literally no lip and just even just chunk out a sand iron that goes 12 yards, 13 yards back in play, I've now had two shots, but this is a par five. I can, I can make a six. That's, that's okay. And then carry on playing the hole. Those little, like you said before, about you, you had how many shots in how many bunkers? 21 shots in six bunkers. So if that was... Seven, seven shots in one of those bunkers. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. In, in yeah, one bunker. So if that sounds obvious, if you could take that down to two shots as opposed to seven, there's yeah. five shots straight away. And also, if I couldn't get out of bunkers, I'd still be in one now. So I've got out yeah. of every bunker oh, yeah. I've ever been in. <laughs> That's, That's a very a good, good point. point. <laughs> and then the other thing I was going to say as well, and we, me and Rick sometimes talk about this a little bit, and I probably shouldn't say this when we have a YouTube channel, but I think some golfers now, and maybe you sound a little bit like this, almost have too much access to information. So I remember when I was a junior and I was getting better at golf and learning the game, there was today's golfer and golf monthly magazines came out once a month, but there was you know golf on Sky Sports. Well, obviously there wasn't the internet, and there wasn't YouTube, etc. So a lot of me getting better was going out on the golf course and just trying things and just playing and just playing the game. Whereas I think sometimes these days, as, as beneficial as coaching videos are, and we see a lot of benefit in those, a lot of people get better. We get amazing messages off people who've watched Rick and got better. But I think sometimes people search for things online and even go into the driving range and trying to work on their angle of attack and the descent angle and have portable launch monitors. We're just going out on the golf course and playing the game and learning can actually dramatically improve your score. Well, three things I'd like Rick's take on that are all sort of part of this question is a golf swing ha fundamentally has to be a simple action or people would never have been able to do it when golf was invented. They'd have never been able to put a ball down in a field and said, see, you can get it to that tree quicker. Yeah. So it has that to tree. <laughs> but it has to quicker. be <laughs> But it has to be fundamentally you can't be asking the body to do something it, it, it doesn't want to do. No, true. Secondly, it is the only sport on earth where you don't practice on the surface you play on. Not in this country. No. Yeah, often in other countries there are. Yeah. UK is really bad for for our practice facilities are often on mats. Yeah. Driving ranges under covers, <clears throat> where you go to the states or you go to Portugal or where, you know where it's warm weather and the mm. grass is beautiful, manicured, and you can stand on grass with a beautiful you know pyramid of, of golf balls and hit off grass. However, what's really interesting, whenever I've shown Americans a driving range over here, they wish they had that. They don't have the luxury of going to a to a venue of, of an evening and actually have a driving range like we have in the UK. It's very different. It would so be nice to have both. It would massively. The other thing that I think that we've done in the UK that they've not done in America, when we built golf courses originally, we never factored in practice grounds. No. Mm. Modern golf venues have, you go to like a, a, a resort golf course or the Oxfordshire where you went to, that, that will have a designated practice facility with grass. And the pyramids of balls. I mean, they that's are the best, best in it. The like best tour, product, site yeah. in golf it's is the best when you adder. turn up to a grass range with a pyramid Correct. of balls. Correct. <laughs> so to, to, I, it is out there. But it's, it's sometimes it's harder to find the correct practice facilities. I always think this, when <clears throat> when we've been, where did we go? I don't know, maybe I went to America or something. Anyway, I was at a venue and I was like, oh, Dubai. I was over in Dubai. I was like, honestly, if I'd have spent my youth here in Dubai playing golf every day, I'd be a tour pro. Like, mm. I genuinely believe that because the facilities, the environment that you're in, the, the, the perfect greens, the facilities, everything else. But just because those facilities are there doesn't breed extra new fantastic golfers. You know, even golfers like, um, I'm sure it was like Kiridek Capybara, a uh, tour player, really, he kind of 
learned on really basic kind of environments. And well, stuff. didn't Sevi learn on the beach? The yeah, like Sevi, and... like Sevi learned. It was more. It it was actually more putting yourself in scenarios. It's creativity, that are, correct? But it's more. It's more scenarios that are actually not manicured and hills and rough and long grass. And and if I'm honest, the only place you ever get that is out on the golf course with wind and rain and you know and horrible situations. Whenever I've had lessons. I'm sort of aware that what they're teaching me is the golf swing, but I'm not playing mm. golf swing game. I'm playing golf. And whenever I've said, could we play out on the course, there's this look of panic in the, in the teacher's eyes, which is like, oh, um, well, that's a bit of a... Do you, really, do you really want to have to go out on the... But the idea that you could say how... I could have 100 lessons and have never, never set foot on grass. I could never have mm-hmm. had mud. I could never have had to deal with <laughs> slope. I could... Because so, mud, you've got to add a club. Yeah, if it's muddy, sometimes yeah. too. Yeah, wet, windy hills, and, and no one's ever dug into the f- the floor of a driving range. And I'm going out on the course, thinking I was hitting it so sweetly on the range, and yet I'm getting these these sort of divot, sort of a foot long, sort of skid mark divot. And you're like, well, obviously because the mat hits, bounces your club back up. Mm-hmm. So you're sort of there's two separate sports there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, going back to the question you had about golfers, uh, golf professionals going out on the golf course and teaching, there possibly is a, a fear because it's much more time. They're gonna have to charge an awful lot more or charge an awful lot less and earn less for that time. Which you know, I understand from a business that's not ideal. Sometimes golfers at uh, facilities don't have the luxury of going out on the golf course. Sometimes there's barriers that can be put in place. But I'm not saying there's no, th- you know, there's no excuse. Ideally, yes, you would take every student out on the golf course. But the other thing, sometimes as well, on the golf course. Let's say we go out on the golf course for an hour, and, and I'm teaching how to play golf. In an hour, we might only play four holes. You might have only hit twenty golf shots, mm. which is actually not a great deal of, sh- of shots. Where in a studio for an hour, you can hit fifty golf balls and work on a technique. Again, it's just balance. It's a good mix, isn't it? To I have think it both. has to be a mix. It has yeah. to be. You have you to know, be able to go somewhere where you can mm. play the same shot twenty or thirty times just to feel what it feels Correct. like. Correct to get that mechanics, you know, so so that when you do start, because one well, of I the think a lot of people get very good at hitting balls off mats. Hundred. You know, another thing with this 100%. is that when you hit balls off mats, you're often just focused on strike, which is obviously important. But then when you get in a golf course, if you strike an iron well, but it's the wrong club and ends up in the bunker ten yard short instead of on the green, that's going to be a problem. So a lot of golfers, when they go to the driving range, and we talk about this a lot, they just hit ball, hit ball, hit ball. You need to actually focus on targets, play different shots, play yeah. three-quarter shots, and really kind of understand your golf swing like that as opposed to, oh, that felt good. Because I've hit a lot of shots on the golf course that feel good, but end up in the pond or Correct. over the green or whatever. goes back to your point about being creative. Being on the driving range, Matt, you can still be creative. You know, even th- daft things like having a foot off the mat, putting mm. the ball on a different location on the mat. So it's not as so kind of linear it, it, you're experimenting with it, the hitting shots where uh, you are going for different targets and you're swapping clubs and you're yeah. measuring the wind and, you, and you're actually visualizing the shot and doing your practice swings. Taking your time at the driving range, does you, as much as I agree, it's not the same, 100%. And even now it's gone to the point where simulators have become a lot more popular now. So even the, the flight is simulated, which again isn't the same as seeing a real ball flight. I just think there's limitations and a way that golf has become more... Um, inclusive and to be able to get players to hit more balls are facilities like driving ranges and simulators and things like that but it is taking away people from the golf courses you know people are mm. becoming driving range golfers mm. and not becoming golfers i'm a very good driving range golfer aren't i he's the best if you saw me hit a drive on the driving range at trafford down the road you'd think i was probably like a plus two handicapper because i'm free there's no consequences i hit it hard hit it far i can shape it get me on the golf course and honestly it, i can hit it well i can also miss the fairway. 100 yards either way but also there's there's a whole side of the game of playing rounds of golf which is strategy mm-hmm. shot selection none of that you, you can really replicate no. on a on a on a driving range so people are being taught to swing the club well they're not going right this your your shot tends to tend, you've got to fade so you You've you've got a you've got water where your natural shot shape goes. Yep, so where are you gonna where are you gonna line up? And if you hit the driver here, you're actually bringing that bunker into play. So it might be advantageous to hit a five iron off yep. this tee. And then are you really gonna get another five iron onto the green, or do you want to hit a nine iron? And then you're on the green in three. You've got putt for par. Yeah, that's never been a part of any lesson I've ever had. That well, it's it's well you need to you need to come under yeah. and uh, you need you need to sort of be uh, be really turning. 
I'm never on a golf course well, if I thought, well, the amount I turn is going to change the fact. <laughs> well, we, we talk about a lot with launch monitors. Oh, yeah. Like launch monitors, as much as they're a tool, and I use it as a tool for not only coaching, but reviewing and testing. And, and I do like hitting golf balls on launch monitors. It's become so the norm that, you know, people are like, on, on a driving range, oh, I've hit that. And it's, it's spun at like 2,500 spin. On a golf course, you'd never question the spin. Yeah. You'd hit a drive and go, I love that. That was crushed. Mm. Like, I never, I'm never looking and going, oh, you know what? I've just spun that 100 RPM too much. And you go for a fitting now and, it, and it's, you have to get the spin rate right and the launch angle right. And yeah. and it's lost that feel it has. And I t- totally agree. Just a quick one on, on experience. So I would I would agree. I think there's a there's a market and actually one is starting to, to emerge a little bit. This is quite interesting. I don't mind giving this uh, this kind of company a little bit of a plug here. I think there's going to be a separation between golf professionals who coach and golf professionals who train. But also, I think the, the people who train out on the golf course, who, who manage you around, aren't also going to be golf professionals. So there's a new company um, set up by caddies who are out on the on the tour. Well, that's ju- the, the, what an amazing idea. So mm-hmm. caddies, in their spare time, again, uh, this is the balance at the moment. They've probably not got enough spare time yet, but you can hire a caddy for a round of golf and they will manage you around the golf course. They won't give you anything technical, but they will manage you and they'll say, you know, have you thought about playing yeah. the hole this way? Have Don't you thought hit about your five, it? I hit a seven iron to yeah. there. The, well, that, I think even you doing that, you would break 90. Uh, yeah, I agree. If, well, if, if Rick was on your bag, you'd break 90 today. I think I don't think there is a golfer in the country whose handicap is above 15 who wouldn't shoot their best round yeah. with someone who knows the course, who maybe knows a little bit about their game, telling them what shots to mm-hmm. hit. Yeah. Because I look back at rounds in my head recently of where I've messed up, and it's, it's, it's either shot choice or not not committing to a shot. Those are the two problems I have. Yeah. I'll hit uh, and th- like you say there's nothing more frustrating than hitting the perfect shot. Well, hitting the ball perfectly, but it not being the perfect result. But not being the right shot. It happens a lot. And because to- because when you're bad and inconsistent, it's quite hard to know so say I've got 100 yards to the green and I'm playing badly. Do I hit do I pick a 9 iron thinking you're going to hit this badly and it's going to go 100 yards. Yeah. Or do I hit? Do I pick the sand wedge and go, no, this is your 100-yard club? So what, it's always the opposite of what you do. And, that, and, <clears throat> and that's the balance. Just a quick one. It was a tour caddy experience of the guys who are doing that, just for anyone watching and listening. Um, with the... And this I've seen this on the golf course and when I give advice to my students before. You can give the best advice. It's measured. It's calculated. Everything's lined up. And they can still stand the ball, stand over the ball, and hit a crap shot. Mm-hmm. It, it just happens. Yeah. Like bad shots happen. And as you mentioned, do you play for your best shots or do you play for your worst shots? It's so hard to predict. Well, what about this? I've just thought of an analogy. It might not make sense, but I think it kind of does in terms of golf versus the driving range. Let's just say I said, um, I want to become a boxer, right? In 12 months, I want to have my first fight and I want to be a boxer. And for the next 12 months, I'm going to go and see a trainer. I'm going to work on my power. I'm going to hit. Um, I'm going to use the punch bag all the time. A little bit of pads, but mostly punch bag. I've even got machines that tell me the angle that I punch at, the power that I deliver, etc. But I don't have a single spar. I get into the ring now. I, I might have a, a, a good punch. It might be powerful. I might have um, you know good angles and you know, good movement. But as soon as I get punched. Not I'm gonna. I'm not experienced it. As soon as I get against the ropes a little bit, I'm not experienced it. As soon as they punch me up, you know, I see an opening, but I don't. I don't go for it. Cause I didn't know to do that. So it's very different. It's a little bit. I mean, not the best analogy, but it's kind of similar. I think it's how good because at the range, nothing is fighting back. Exactly you. on a golf course, especially with wind and. Stuff. I mean, I can't remember the last time I thought about wind on a range. Yeah. The, ra- the, the 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 basically the the range essentially is the punch bag. Yeah. It's good for technique. But it's not sparring, which is the golf course. So it's, a bit, it's, it's a bit like if snooker players could only practice on turf. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then it Imagine. comes to... And then, then suddenly they're on this table. And they don't know how the ball reacts. Yeah, like I say, I, I, I do think there's an opening. I, I, and it's shown in possibly performance as well, as much as players are apparently hitting the golf ball longer. I don't know if you've seen some reports recently from the USGA and the RNA who are saying golfers, certainly at the best level, are hitting the ball longer. Scores haven't dramatically improved. It's, well, I I heard they stayed the same yeah. over the past sort of 20, 30 years, exactly. which is, you know, I like playing with nice clubs. I love watching people play nice clubs. I love watching reviews of nice clubs. It's like watching Top Gear with a, like a Ferrari and a Lamborghini going up against a Porsche, and it's just, it's great to watch. 
But it's such a damning indictment of all of those uh, technical advances and new colors and new shapes and twists and weights and shafts that we're still just as bad as golf as mm -hmm. we were. We're just hitting one shot in 10 further. Yeah, very and, true. And at the driving range, we're hitting it further. Yeah. And our launch monitors, we're hitting it further. And it has been proven that the best players in the world are hitting it further. And, and the best players in the world are scoring better, but the average scores for most people aren't really improving. And I think a lot of that, again, is down to how we train as golfers. I, I, and guys, I point before, I also think golfers are overthinking it now. Like mm -hmm. you mentioned before on your days off and you'll, you'll strategize, you know, put a strategy in place for mm -hmm. getting around the golf course. It's not real life because no. it changes. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. <clears throat> I don't think I've ever had a strategy massively going into a round of golf. I'm more, if I, if, you know, some of my best rounds of golf, I've run late to the tee. I've not been prepared. I've hardly got any tee pegs. Yeah, you know, that's true. And, and I stand there with no expectation level and a bit like rushing, a bit flustered and, and play a great round. Other times I can go there an hour and a half early, hit golf balls till I'm blue in the face feel like I've measured the freaking wing speed and the, and the temperature and the way that I'm feeling and warmed up and go out and shoot freaking 88 or whatever. Like yeah, yeah. There, there's no, sometimes it's, it, it, what works for you, I think again with like training devices and launch monitors and sorry, if you can hear the, uh, um, whatever that is, an ambulance, police it's car. Something like that. Um, in the background. Um, look with like GPSs and, and, information it's, it is handy it's useful information but i've seen guys with like a watch a G handheld gps device um a, a something a speed on which like <laughs> way too much information and it it clouds their way of playing i honestly think people sometimes will turn up better slightly hungover a bit running late or in not really today yeah <laughs> john john was in manchester <laughs> last night and sat in a bar for what four hours on your own uh, yeah i'd never you think i'll get there early and beat the traffic i don't want to be caught in traffic around manchester and um then you get there and you think i think the real reason that you got here at um half past four is so that you could go to that pub next to the hotel that you were thinking <laughs> about sense. since the moment you got up this morning <laughs> so just a little bit off topic then something that john may or may not be aware of Every week, we have a listener of the week, okay? So... I already like the possible candidate for listener yeah, of the week. Yeah, so is. listener of the week, basically, there's a s several criteria that the listeners have to hit. So they have to email us, which is podcast at rickshields.com. They have to start the email off with, hi, Guy and Rick. So it's not, hi, Rick, Rick and Guy. It's, it's, it's Guy's little way of it's, control. It's, hi, Guy and guy's Rick. Guy's little bit okay? of fame. Can, does it have to be A and D, or do they have to use an ampersand? Are there any more stipulations? I like an ampersand, ideally. Okay. Just saves time, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is ampersand a little squiggly thing? Yeah. yeah. I, I said that without really knowing what it was. I was going to say, what the hell yeah, is that? But this has actually got an ampersand, so that's another point. And we also like some evidence and some, some reason and some rationale as why they should be listening to the week. And this week, we've got a good one. Can I just say, this is, that is a great feature for a radio show, so... I'm just going to make a little note. <laughs> Maybe. Well, Paul, I'll, what is your radio? What, where can people listen to your radio show? Oh, uh, you can hear the Ellis James and John Robbins show uh, Fridays on BBC F Radio 5 Live from 1 till 3. Wow, that was harder than it should have been. <laughs> yeah. A little bit, yeah. 1, 2, 3 on Fridays on 5 Live. Um, Lots of numbers, though, though, to be fair, isn't there? Radio 5 Live. Yeah, there was a lot. 1 till 3. For a man who's only been doing that job for what, eight months, it, that was hard asking me what our show's called. Friday 1 till 3. <laughs> Do you record, is it live? A live radio show? Yeah. Is it really? Yeah. What do you talk about? Mainly. Uh, I'm not a big radio listener. Don't you <laughs> worry. Um, so we have a feature called John's Shame Well, where people write in with their most shameful experiences, <laughs> and I read them from the bottom of the well. Um, <laughs> we could do this for golf. Yeah, yeah. Golf is So we'll take well. some of your yeah, ideas. Yeah. And you, you can have, have listener of the week. We'll yeah. trade we'll you. We'll give you that. Yeah, you we'll know, trade you from stories in the bottom of the well. That would be... You do have that. Imagine that. Yeah, you know, I think we are going to do Golfers who've cheated and never well, we, we told could, anyone. We could, we could be... Um, I like first tea nightmares. Oh, yeah. I, like I think we need to get John Robbins' name in there somewhere. So, the bottom of the well brought to you by John Robbins. <laughs> Unless he's sponsoring it. <laughs> no, he's, he's not having any name on it. Anyway, <laughs> back, back, so, we've also, though, so we have this listener of the week. And then, a few weeks ago, we had the, uh, the now infamous Ed Brown. So, Ed Brown wrote in with such, John a, knows good, who had such a good email. He became a VIP listener. And he's actually, if you look to your left up there he's on the wall of the vip wall it's not oh, past that lovely so i think this week potentially we could have a new vip oh, I, so we've I, not I think i know the, why at the moment this, i've just noticed something several reasons why out. so let me read this some of the email hi guy and rick you guys the best so what a nice start please can I apply for listener of the week 
Um, he's a very ded dedicated fan. He watches all the videos. Now, the big thing for me is the amount of screenshots he sent us. So, firstly, he's a podcast subscriber. I've got a screenshot to prove it. He follows Rick on Twitter. He actually follows me on Twitter, which gets him a bonus point. He follows Rick on Instagram. He likes the videos. He's got a screenshot that likes the videos. Everything you've got. Subscribe to the second channel, which is the channel that people are watching this on, potentially. One of the big reasons why, <laughs> and I'm well enough saying this, he's actually also called Guy. Oh. So Guy Bowyer is listener of the week. A couple of guys. A couple of guys just chilling. <laughs> just a, couple just a couple of guys, guys that's no good. Out. And <laughs> I, I started think, making trouble in my neighbourhood. <laughs> I think, Rick, it's only fair that he can be a VIP. Oh, I'll have to vet it. You can have a look through. He's definitely listener of the week. I'm going to give him that. It's down can to I you. Can I just read this, by the way? Um... If I had a time machine that could take you back... Oh, no, are these questions? These are questions. All oh, right. Well, yeah, let's answer give, this one. He's given a really good one, so let me just like find this. it again. <laughs> so this is another reason why I didn't get he's on doing this all right. Guy Bowyer. Guy uh, Bowyer. I think it's Bowyer. It's spelt B-O-W-Y-E-R. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking that. at John because I know that John went to Oxford, so <laughs> I'm leaning on you for this. I saw that on your Wikipedia this morning. Did you? Yeah. Well, there's some <laughs> stuff on there that isn't true. Is it true that you shared a house with Russell Howard? Yes. I like Russell That's quite Howard. Cool. Do you? Russell Howard's like a proper comedian. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. I, I'll give you that. Yeah, I'll give you that. <laughs> Does he still do the, the news show? What's it called? Good News. He, no, that became... You can't be that big of a fan, Rick. Come he on. he moved from BBC, the BBC to it? Sky, so it's the Russell Howard Hour on Sky. All right. It's good. It's great. It's he's, a phenomenon. He's a, fu he's a funny guy. And who, was there someone else you shared with? John Richardson. Yes, from Countdown. Yes. Fame. Yeah. That's mad. Um, was it like being in a, in a house with like the three comedians? It was you. It was so, there was another, three, there another guy as well. Uh, Mark Olver, who's so we were all in Bristol, and um, it was great. I mean, that was like that was sort of my training ground when I just started. Was it just full on banter, or I don't like the word it, banter so much? But is it? It well, the term banter still meant banter back in those days. It wasn't <laughs> just sort of men being really aggressive with each other, right? Yeah. Um, sort of bullying. <laughs> back, back then, it just meant making just, each just other banter. laugh. Just <laughs> banter. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it was it was great, it, it and it was, and and you know it's the same when groups of friends live together. But when sort of groups of comics get together or live together, it's sort of amped up a bit. But you have running jokes that you have sort of callbacks to jokes and little sort of phrases and stuff, and and you're sort of it's like spinning plates sometimes when you're just chatting, and <laughs> it teaches you to be quick. quick. It, that muscle in your head that goes on to be the, the comedy muscle that you use is getting trained every time, every thing you're doing is constantly thinking, is the joke? What's the joke? He's made a really funny Do you almost feel yeah. like you become a character in the house in a way? You've all got your own kind of roles. Certainly, yeah. Richardson was, oh, bloody hell, who's put Coco Pops <laughs> in the fridge? Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> and then um, Russell was the guy who made the mess that made John go, oh, bloody, never yeah. with bloody self. <laughs> And then Alva would just come back late at night with a takeaway and just sort of um, watch it all take place. What was your character in the house? Well, I went into that house not drinking. Hadn't had a drink for um, about a year. And I came out of that house. <laughs> Rolling. <drinking. laughs> so, Rolling out the house. I remember it was Richardson made a... He made, we were at home on a Sunday. And he was an amazing cook. He is an amazing cook. And I used to eat meat at the time. And he made this lamb shank. I'd never had a lamb shank before let alone seen someone who wasn't a chef make a lamb shank. Yeah, yeah. Impressive. And he made it, and he put garlic in the lamb. He cut oh, holes nice. in it and shoved bulbs of garlic in, and he had a bottle of white wine, and I hadn't had a drink for about nearly two years. What? And I was just like, I need I'm going to need a glass of that white <laughs> wine, mate. Next thing you know, cut to me on the floor. <laughs> oh, you shouldn't have given me the lamb. It's the lamb's fault. And he knew you did it on purpose, didn't you? <laughs> it's the lamb's fault. <laughs> Ten years later, he's up in Manchester. In is he, is a bar he in Manchester now? Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in a bar on his own. <laughs> Ask it. Uh, even, you're vegan now, do you say? Yeah, pretty much. But some, some Pretty time, much. Well, I've never said I am f full on 100% vegan because just... The, the hours that I keep and the places I have to eat sometimes I will just eat a cheese sandwich if yeah. it's one in the morning and you don't eat meat no not, not eat meat for since lamb shank no I haven't eaten meat since um, uh, the kebab last night it's about <laughs> five six years ago I can tell you the story it's disgusting no <laughs> okay don't put me off I, I, like, I had I, a bad I, experience I, in Hernando no. all right all right okay um, as well. so the question that guy had anyway that that I've got one more question. Who's the funniest guy in the house? Was there a, in was that a, house? Yeah. 
Is is it as easy as saying that or not? Like, so I feel like if it was a house full of golfers, one of them would be the best golfer. Mm. Yeah, but you can define best golf. By that's, that's, what I'm th- that's what I'm interested in. Can you define best fun- most uh, funny? Is it subjective? It is subjective. It also depends what sort of what you're after. John Richardson, I have to say, is one of the quickest people. He's so dry, isn't he? He is the speed at which he's got a joke. Russell probably perhaps has the more... Um, this is more the, written. This is sort of more of a flourish yeah. to his jokes. In the house, I mean. But Richardson, for speed, is, is one of the... one of the qu- Bang. Russell more of a storyteller. Yeah, Go. Russell likes to do little act-outs. Right. Um, so he had good. He's got good sort of voices and little sort of imagined scenarios. Whereas if you want a pun, if you need to stake your life on someone coming up with a pun in two and a half seconds, Richardson, he's already done five. What? Um, I see those programs where they'll literally come on stage and sell, tell like jokes. Like I don't. What is it? What's the program called? Where it's it's all comedians mm. they're on stage and literally a word pops up and you've got to make a joke oh, about yeah, it. On, on That's. I mean, you know, top of what? No, I can, I'll talk about it. They, you know, that in advance. Yeah. Oh right. It's, it's not. Oh. There, there's not. Unfortunately, there's not a commissioner. You've just told Rick that yeah. Santa's not real. <laughs> so there is not a commissioner in this country who would allow comedians who would just trust comedians to be funny. Okay. Yeah. Because that, that could go wrong. Okay. Yeah. All um, right. Well, that's well, that's made it more interesting for me. Unless um, it was like a genuine improv show, like whose line is it anyway? Yes. So that's 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 genuine improv. Who who's you? Comedy inspiration. Sorry, I know we're going off topic. We'll no, come to Guy fine. in a minute. Guy's, list, guy's listener of the week. He's fine. It feels weird like, saying Guy that's not me. I, I got into comedy through being a fan of TV comedy, so I was never, like, uh, uh, obsessed with stand-up. Russell Howard is a great example of someone who has encyclopedic knowledge of stand-up, probably 1980 to 2010. Okay. He he could. He knows every scene knows from every comedy. Well, he knows every Eddie Murphy routine. Okay, he yeah. knows every kind and of Billy Russell, Connolly sorry, routine. Did you That's say? Russell, yeah. yeah. And 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 Richardson does as well. But I was always obsessed with sitcoms. So my comedy sort of inspiration hero is sort of a cross between Rick Mail and Alan Partridge. Oh yeah, Rick Mail from Bottom. Yeah, Bot- so Bottom. That was Rick so Mail's so great because you can you can define your age by where you know Rick Mail from. Yeah, so yeah. you're either. A, uh, you're either a Young Ones fan. A so I think I must, I missed Young Ones, I think. Yeah, I missed Young Ones. So Bottom, for me, yeah, is an 11 so or 12-year-old. Oh, my God. I've mm-hmm. never yeah, listened I was much about, in my life. <clears throat> yeah, I was about 9, 10, thinking this is the greatest thing. I shouldn't be watching it doesn't this. doesn't get better than this. It's the be- best thing I've ever seen. Um, or uh, Fil- yeah, bottom, Filthy God, Rich yeah. and Cat Flap was another thing he was in. Or, yes, uh, or Alan Bastard. So he's got these sort of projects. But for me, it was Bottom. So I, I will show my girlfriend an episode of Bottom. I'm like... You, hold on to your hats because you're going to laugh so mm-hmm. hard and she will sit there saying I don't get it what, yeah I don't think gross. my wife would like what it what is mm. they're just I mean they're actually farting yeah their, their bums are on fire <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like yeah, it's just it's great best. <laughs> their bums are on fire <laughs> he's just <laughs> himself for the third time this episode <laughs> yeah I don't think uh, like that's the type of humour I could tell is it but it's not just male humour that is it because obviously Female fans... No, and weirdly... I feel like blokes would like it more. Looking back at Bottom, I thought it would have dated much worse than it has. I've not seen a recent one. There As is in, I've not seen one, recently. an old one, recently, yeah. Because, you know, so much has changed in terms of comedy and sexual politics and stuff mm-hmm. for the better over the last three or four or five years. So I thought, looking back at Bottom, from what I remember it, two grubby blokes. Yeah, yeah. But they're always the butt of the joke. They yes. always lose. And... Um, and also what strikes me is how brave a show it is because every episode starts, it's two guys sat with nothing to do. Now, to write a sitcom from the premise, oh, we're going to do 18 episodes, each episode starts, two guys haven't got anything to do. How the hell do you come yeah. no, it's not- We struggle for YouTube videos. Like, <laughs> like, that's crazy, isn't it? But um, yeah, so that's, that's, my, that's really close to my heart. I know it sounds ridiculous. <clears throat> Because I kind of know how I got into golf and becoming a golf professional and this being my job. I even remember, obviously, starting YouTube and why that became a career. Like, how did comedy become it? Did someone just say to you, you're bloody funny at one point? Like, how Absolute, did it happen? Absolutely did it, yeah. not. No. Oh, right. No. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not. Is that the issue? <laughs> still, that's still a rarity. You're still waiting. I, so I finished uni. I did English at uni, moved back to Bristol, 
I was working in a bookshop, like all English graduates tend <laughs> to do. And I'd always like really loved comedy, and I'd, but I didn't really know what how you got into comedy. Yeah, I, don't, like, I wouldn't even do? know where to start. So I started writing down little ideas in a little book. And then you start to think, well, that, this is no good. I'm sat in my bedroom in Bristol writing ideas in a book. So that's not. A, you know, there's no way that could be a job. And I'd kind of been a bit um, resistant to stand up, I think. And what was behind that was I was jealous. I was jealous of people who could stand on stage and hold a microphone and get laughs, and that could be their job. So for a couple of months, I stayed writing in my little book and being all kind of frustrated. Right, it's slightly harder in your book. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, I, then I quit drinking. And so this is basically my comedy, my, my drinking ended the day before. My, I say my drinking, I was just drinking too much. And um, I stopped drinking. The next week I went to do an open, I went to watch an open mic comedy night okay. in the back of a pub, six people in the audience. It's crazy. The week after that, I said to the guy, can which I, is Mark, who we lived with, I said, can I do it next week? He said, yeah. So I did it next week. It was my first no ever gig. Way. Six wow. people or uh, more than six? Six, or? seven, maybe. Wow. I'd never... So my first ever stand-up gig I ever went to was the, the one before that. The second one was the first one I did. Wow. And I came off stage, and it had gone fine. I'd overrun. I told a story that was too long. And I was like, well, 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 when, when can I do this again? I need to do this again. I need to do this again. When can I do it again? And he said, well, you can't do it here next week, but there's one in Cardiff that runs on a Sunday. So you could do, you could maybe give the guy in Cardiff a call. So he gives me the number. So the next Sunday, I go and do one in Cardiff. That one went a little bit better. So I thought, well, well I, need, I need, need to do another one. <laughs> I need to do another one tomorrow. Well, I can't. So I had to wait till the next Sunday. So I got into this situation of having to wait every Sunday to do these gigs alternating between Bristol and Cardiff. And then my, at work, at Borders, the bookshop, they said, oh, we, um, we need to change the shifts. And, um, you, we need you to come in next three Sundays. Oh, no. And it was like I just got this knot in my stomach going, I, 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 can't, I can't do Sunday because it's the gig on Sunday. That's all you were working for all week was the gig. Yeah, to do this gig. And, you know, no money, you know, driving across in my old mini. <coughs> and and how far? Just, is, uh, it's not far from Bristol to Cardiff, is it? About an hour. Right. Yeah, so not too bad, but just loving it. And also having this great thing to do when I wasn't boozing. So yeah, I was yeah. having, like, or just on Diet Cokes and stuff. And then, uh, and I said to my boss, and to this day, I can't believe I did. I said, I'm, I've quit because <laughs> I need to do this. And he was like, what do you mean? You, you need to do a gig once a week for no money. So I stopped. It was maybe three months after my first gig. I quit. I handed in my notice. And since then, I've been a comic. No way. Now, I didn't earn enough money from it. I have sort of temping here and yeah, there yeah, for, yeah. for, for quite a while. Of course, that's afterwards. what you've got to do. Absolutely. Isn't it? And then... Um, and then it was then it was my job, and you're like, how is this your job? And then, and then so you've got all the gigs you're doing, and you're sort of, you know, I was basically earning enough to pay my rent, yeah, and bills, and then you're like, oh, there's this thing I can do, and this thing, and how do I, how do I get onto this thing? And so seven years after I started, I moved to London, and you know, there's just always another thing you can be doing, um, and comedians as a bunch are very very supportive despite what people might think about, you know, I bet they're all really bitchy or sort of jealous or whatever. But actually, if you go, how did you get that thing? And they'll go, oh, you need to call this person, say I told you to call. I told, yeah. Yeah, so really, really great sense of community amongst, amongst comics. What's your biggest gig to date? I saw you did Apollo. Yeah, it would be the Apollo. So I've done that to three gi- times now. To give some context to, to uh, maybe our US listeners. What? How big is the Apollo audience? Um so the the Apollo is probably the biggest room in the in the country that you would still call a theatre as opposed to a stadium okay. or a, an arena. So what's it like? Three thousand three hundred. Okay. So, and it's really interesting. So I've, I've so I've never done an arena gig or a stadium gig, and they range from sort of three thousand to, to ten thousand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, the, the I see like ones. Mickey Flanagan and yeah, guys man. like like wow. filling out the MEN and things like that. And Peter Kay, like. So that's a whole different beast, and it's not it's 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 a different skill set. Of course, it has to be. And there, you know, I, there's no way I could step on stage with the stuff I'm doing in the rooms I'm doing at those rooms. Yeah, it would just be like so it would like be playing a, a two thousand yard golf course. <laughs> would it be like me chuck, throwing me onto the first tier Augusta? It'd be like throwing you on stage at the Apollo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think I'd be all right with that. Do you get nervous when you go on the stage at Apollo? Um. 
the first time. What I are you more nervous for now? Sorry, today teeing off on the first tee or when you do a gig? First tee. Really? I oh. had a dream. So I slept for four <clears throat> hours last night in two. Yeah, you had a proper good night. In two <laughs> chunks. I woke up at four this morning in my hotel. I had a dream where I sat next to Roger Taylor, the drummer from Queen. And I'm asking, and it's a music, big music concert. And I say, why don't you do festivals that often, Roger? And he's telling me about why it's not practical for them to do festivals. It's an in-depth in depth dream, this. Yeah, Brian walks in. It's a question I've always wanted to ask them. Why don't you do Glastonbury? <laughs> Brian walks in. He's got his guitar. I said, Brian, I'm just chatting to... Um, just chatting to Rog about why you guys don't actually play Rog many, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just chatting to Rog as to why you guys don't play many festivals. And he sort of just sort of shrugs and looks at me. And then he nods at a piece of music. And I realize I've got a guitar in my hands. And there's the guitar solo from Killer Queen. And I realize I've agreed to be their, like, second guitarist on stage. And he's about to start playing. And Roger's now sat his drum kit. And I haven't picked up a guitar since I was about 18. And... The, ple- the, the plectrum is like six inches long and I realise I'm about to play guitar in front of Brian, Brian May and completely, I've got no, I don't even know where to start. And then I wake up oh. and that's because... Is you playing golf today? I'm playing golf with golf's version of Brian May. Oh, what the hell? The Brian May of golf. <laughs> Rick Shields. Can we clip that, please? I think when this goes out, though, the video will hopefully have already gone out. So people, there's going to be basically four situations. Either we don't play because it, well, you don't play because it gets too wet and rainy. Either I'm saying it like I, I, I don't, as in like I'm a pampered princess. I don't play when it's wet and rainy. No, because we can't film in the rain. <laughs> I thought you meant just me. Then. Oh no, you can't film. You don't film in the rain. No. no. So Come that's on. one situation. So people listening now, the video may not have happened. People think Manchester's just sunny all the time. The other situation is. You have played and it was a half, you drew. So good game, guys. No, that's good. The next is that Rick won. So well done, Rick, for Thanks. your win. That's what we're doing here. <laughs> and the last one is that John won. Well, people that are listening now will have seen the video. Oh, I get you. So one of those situations is, has ah. happened. So we invited John up today, not only to do the podcast, even though this kind of was a little bit of a last minute, mm-hmm. I thought John really had an interesting story within golf and, and as our first guest. But we had an idea for a video which we've banked because it's a a different idea than what we're actually filming today but today we're going to film myself as a golf professional i don't know who i'm talking to here, cameras and you guys with one club versus john a bad golfer with all 14 clubs mm. playing off scratch nine holes who can win that's the video that's on the youtube channel right whoa, now whoa, 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 whoa. playing off scratch but you've got all your clubs rick's got a club just one okay you can I, pick my club I know if you wish. How, i know how many of my clubs are useful to me <laughs> You can it's actually, it's a real disadvantage, some of the clubs I have in my bag. That, I think that would be good if you, you can pick any club but can't be driver. Like it's got to be an iron. Yeah, it's got to be an iron. So you can pick. Well, here's my thinking, right? So how, how far do you hit a seven iron? 170. Wow. So how, is there a 20 iron? <laughs> <laughs> what you've got to remember though is, the lower I've got loft, a chip with it. The, yeah, with the lower it. lofted club he gets. So if he gets a three iron, he's going to hit it a long way. But, but if he's in the bunker. You, I've seen you bogey a hole with a four iron against Tommy Fleetwood. I know, that's true. I, I, you could give me a thousand clubs and wouldn't bogey that hole. <laughs> we might work it. We might try and work some of that. That's the plan. That's the premise. No, I think it's a good, I think it's a good idea. I, well, I think it's a great idea. I'm really excited. So, a golf question off the back of that then, because I think we're going to do match play. What is your... As again, as a bad golfer, what's your favourite format of golf? I, I'm a stats guy. I really like numbers. I like the fact that when I'm playing golf, I'm always playing against myself. Mm-hmm. And there's always a goal. So when people go, oh, we just, we just played match play and I'm like, oh, what did you shoot? And like, I don't know. What, but, you know, I won. It was a great game. I'm thinking, what about the stats? What about the figures? What about <laughs> oh, really? the handicap? You know, sure, you want to know how many putts you average. Do you want to know how many fairways you hit? So I like to just play all formats at once. Mm-hmm. So you play... <laughs> that ma- might be where you're going wrong. <laughs> 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 we might have just figured out why the hell... So it's match play. You've got an abacus. You've got a calculator. <laughs> uh, you've got <laughs> you're keeping your stable food and you're keeping your stroke play. So when we played this golf trip in Portugal... The, the sort of prizes are based on stable foot points because that's great because then everyone stands a yeah. chance. The, the sort of the match play is what wins the cup or not. So that's great because it's like, it feels like the Ryder Cup. Mm-hmm. And then people can sort of have their stroke play for their own personal uh, sort of records. And yeah, I think yeah. that's like the nicest way to do it because 
we, what you want is for no one to ever feel like the rest of the day is wasted. Yeah, yeah, of course. So the great thing about match play, as everyone listening to this will know, is you know if I take seven shots to get out of the bunker in match play, there's Pick it up. all the more reason yeah. to get yeah. on the next tee and think, here we go. That's why I love it. I, I love match play. But I, I think, especially when you're starting out, when you're trying to improve... That thing about breaking 90, the first time I broke 100, it is a really good goal to have. No, but I agree. I think you just, I've got to be careful. It doesn't become too big a goal. That, yeah. I, well, I had a guy in for lesson this weekend and, you know, been playing a couple of years. I said to him, so, you know, what, what, what's your handicap? Oh, I don't have one. Okay, no problem. Like, not, not a lot of people do these days. I get that. You know, what's the, what's the best goal you've had? I don't really count. I thought, whoa. What I'm going to struggle with here is how the hell do you know you're going to get any better? Mm. Like, if you literally don't have a handicap and you don't know what score you count off, how are you going to get better? Because mm. it's got to be, you know, <clears throat> if I were to lose weight, I need to know how heavy I am now to know how much I've lost, etc. Like, if you're gonna if you're gonna go out on a golf course, you've got to put a score down, even if it's 127 that you <laughs> you know you got, you've got to know where your starting block is to know how much you've improved by. But if you, as a golf coach, wanted to create the perfect player you would want someone who started off with his, that sort of lack of stress about scores and stuff. <clears throat> because then when you introduce them, you know, he, he'd be so calm on the course. Well, there was an interesting story. McElroy recently did a little interview and it was about his training when he was growing up and his dad, how he, how he trained him into a good position. And basically he um, changed the par of every hole. So if it was a par four, he turned it into a par eight. So when McElroy scored a six, he eagled it. And after nine holes, he'd say to McElroy, okay, well done, son, you've shot four under for nine holes there. And he was like, but yeah, I shot four under. In theory, it wasn't four under. In the real world, it was 20 over or whatever. But because he'd changed his mindset, he thought, I'm four under. And then the next time they went and played, his dad would calcul- change the, cap- the par of the, of the score that day. And then, <clears throat> again, I shot two under. Wow, brilliant, well done, son. Like, every time it seemed like he'd played really well. Well, on the flip side, if it was actual real score... Oh, I've shot 52 again. Ah, oh, So it's like, it is a mindset thing. I do believe that you do need to have a starting block, but then don't get obsessed with it. I think the, the obsession, and again, like we said before, if you start shooting 90 consistently, the next thing you'd want to do is shoot 80, under mm-hmm. 80. Like, it's just what it is. Well, my goal, my dream, and I purposefully made it achievable, is that I want to get to a point in my life, and I don't, it doesn't matter when that is. I die, ideally, I'd like it by the time I'm 40, but maybe by the time I'm 45, I want to play off 18. Yeah. And if I could play off 18, where I'm sort of, if I hit a duff shot, it's maybe one or two Mm. around. It's not this sort of terrifying inconsistency that I have. I would be happy with that. And it's not like, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna play off single figures. I don't have the time. I don't have the, I don't have the dedication to the practice to, I don't have the time to practice or play enough. If I could play off 18, play, two or three times a month, go on a hot trip a year, play some nice shots, be able to feel in control of what I'm doing to an extent, I would be so happy. And and the, the thing I've got now, like you were saying about um, changing the pars, now I have this rule that if I've got a putt for par, no matter how I got onto that green, I cannot be disappointed with myself. You've got to yeah, go, good. mate, you've got yeah. a putt for par. And I don't care if that's 35 feet yeah. or that's stone cold. Par is this is designed for every single golfer to aim for the shot you're about to take. So it doesn't matter if you skid it 60 yards off the tee, you then hit a half decent uh, iron and then a bad chip that's flown past the hole. If you've got a putt for par, you're, you're doing just fine. If anyone has seen any of our videos, you'll know that that sort of mantra, that sort of philosophy is rarely shown. It's usually just me swearing. <laughs> You know, one thing though that I think I really like listening to somebody, you know, with a, a high handicap speak because you know a really bad golfer. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things you mentioned. to say it. Now. Oh, one yeah, yeah, one yeah. of the things you mentioned then was about you want to, you know, you have this aim to be more consistent, and I totally get that. But I don't, I want to kind of almost break it to you in a way that I, unless it never comes because you will get better as a golfer. But like, so I'm a full handicapper, and we could go out today and play me, you, and Rick, and I could shoot four over par, could shoot level par, I could also shoot twelve over par. And although Would you I, ever shoot 55 over par? No, but 12 over par to me is 55 over par. That's the difference, but, you see. But how many... So in terms of consistency, how many nightmare shots are you playing to go 12 over par? 
it's maybe not so many nightmare. And that's that's a good point. It's not so maybe nightmare shots, but it's where I should be. Bo- and bogey holders should be paring. So yeah. it's not like you maybe shanking one out of bounds. Although I sometimes do that still, but it still is that same feeling. So it's the same it, feeling. It's weird. Your because expectation level doesn't it, it advances as you get better at golf. It's like, like your my horrendous shot. You would look at it and go, that's not a horrendous shot. Even there's been mm-hmm. times where I've stood on a tee and there's playing with crowds and whatever, and I'll, and I'll hit a drive, and it's not a nice drive. I've, I've not hit it great. It's kind of looked all right, and I've held my finish. And guys be like, great shot, Rick. That's amazing. I think it wasn't really. Mm-hmm. Like your expectation level. And then sometimes like you actually hit a shot that is wayward, and you think it's the worst shot in the world. And again, either people are watching going, that, was, that wasn't too far off. Your, your own expectation level changes the better you get at golf. I would be so interested in like a year or two to, to speak to you again and see like what you're playing off then and what you perceive as... Because another question I had, and it's a very broad, kind of loaded question, but you meet someone in the pub last night, let's say, and you, they said, oh, I play golf, and they say the handicap. What would the handicap have to be for you to class them as quite a good player? Would oh, it be 18 question. or would it be 15 or would it be scrap? Like what? Because... So... It's obviously subjective. To me, if someone said I'm off plus one, I'm thinking you're a good player. Like if they're off five, thinking you're decent, you're a good player. But so what I'm thinking in that scenario is, would I be embarrassed to play against you? Okay. <laughs> That's all that noise was. <laughs> that was the that was the good point noise. Yeah. <laughs> someone sounds a horn whenever John makes an insightful point. Uh, the horn has now been sounded. Um, it's going to be hard to manage that lorry round the roundabout every time you do an insightful, <laughs> insightful point. <laughs> now, now. <laughs> um, so I think this is a big barrier for people who aren't yet good at golf or maybe will never get good at golf is that embarrassment of being with people on a round who are playing better than them, even if they're not in their group, if they're waiting behind them. And I think if golf clubs really want to thrive, there needs to be a way of balancing pace of play, which annoys me as much as it annoys anyone, with the fact that someone in front of you might take eight shots in this hole, might take nine, might take ten. Mm-hmm. Now, as long as those are t- time is spent playing those ten shots, it's not one shot, then they're checking their phone, yeah. then they're marking their card, then they're doing their binoculars. and you know, that's, bad, that's bad etiquette. But if that person is trying their hardest to efficiently and swiftly play ten shots on a par four, they should f- not be made to feel self-conscious or embarrassed because otherwise w- it's, golf can't just be for good golfers. Mm-hmm. Have you experienced getting, you know, it, it, do we? Do you almost put that thought in your own brain or have you had an experience that would cause that thought? Um, now, that's a really good point. Sometimes you are, you're just you're projecting that on that other group walking past you who you've let play through. And we always, always let people play through. Mm -hmm. That's how you get good pace of play. Um, The old teapot from the tea. That one, I don't like that one. That's the only one that... I I think unless the person in front of you, unless you're actually trying to make some, if you're trying to get their attention, you shouldn't stand on the tee really until... You shouldn't be up on the tee swinging and yeah. sort of hands on your hips and trying to sigh so you can be heard over 100 yeah. yards away. But, you know, that said, pace of play is a problem and it's a very sort of current problem. Um, so w- back to your original question. If someone said to me, I play off 10, I would think, uh, if we play, I'm going to hold you up and it's, you, you, I'm, I would be embarrassed. That said, were I to actually play someone who've played off 10, I stand just a good chance of beating them as if I played Tiger Woods because of the handicap system, that's what's great about you, golf. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because like, I am by no means a superstar. I'm a full handicapper, but I can... No, I'm not. I'm not because I don't want to come... non-superstar. No, but what I mean, I don't want to come across from the next point that I'm something that I'm not because I'm not... You know, I'm an all right club golfer and that's literally it. But I understand what you're saying about the people on the tee and stuff like that, but... Honestly, now, if we went out and played, and again, this is why I said I don't want to sound like a superstar. I said I'm off four and you're off 23. You might feel a bit of pressure or nervous. But honestly, now, and I'm speaking truthfully, I wouldn't be... I've seen bad golfers. I've pl- I, you know, I was a 23 handicapper at one time. So I think sometimes people who are higher handicappers feel nervous about playing with lower handicappers. Yeah. I totally get it. But actually, you don't always need to be. Like, like a lot of people. Yeah, a, a lot of people much. are... A lot of, there is obviously some 
idiots for want of a better word out there but a lot of people are just accommodating yeah. and oh absolutely yeah. and the amount of times that me and Alex have been playing and, and you know some people have played through or some people have come past us and you know we've got the kit and we look like is that is that taking is that taking lots of time people are so nice mm -hmm. they make a little joke about golf or they you know they're self-deprecating don't film me round. don't get me on film yeah, and all, all that, that stuff have a selfie with Alex and and <laughs> <laughs> but I think it is perhaps a slight generational thing that when I see older people playing golf they seem to be just enjoying it yeah. so much more because they're there they're having fun with their mates they they're getting out there they're getting fresh air they're they've got catch up in the clubhouse they have a bit of competition they're not sat there going, why am I, why am I coming up? I'm coming over the top. I'm still coming over the top. Yeah. I had that lesson, I'm coming and over the know, top. And you know, I don't want to put all older people anything into a bracket. No. But a lot of old, and I've got evidence of this from when I've played at golf clubs for since I was eight years old. A lot of the older members or seniors, some are competitive, but a lot of them just get out there, like you said, to have fun, get fresher. They have old battered clubs. They've never had a lesson in their life. And they're not that about how they play, believe it or not. It's so easy to forget how fun golf is. Exactly. It's so easy to forget... So I worked out, and I I, try, I met someone who works for the um, like marketing for golf, and I said, "You know, a round of golf is ten thousand steps." And they were like, "Huh?" Surely they knew that. Well, I just think that's such a great oh, um, way of getting courses. people into golf. <clears throat> of course, it is. You women who do ten thousand steps a day, do it in three and a half hours. Yeah. With a game. Yeah. In the countryside, mm -hmm. you know. Well, you, 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 you may have that idea if you're listening. Whoever may want to turn that into a actually no, copyright John Robbins. <laughs> we need a copyright sound effect as well next. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, I do honestly believe if I see somebody playing bad golf, it, I'm not bothered. Like I'm almost uh, whether because I've seen it or been around it or it's not affecting me. If I saw someone top the first tee shot, I'm like, oh, bless. <laughs> like, I don't want to see that, but I'm not. Interesting. I'm not looking at and going, You're not you shouldn't judging, be on the golf course. Yeah. That time I hit 18 over, my best ever round, which to bring us back to what I was saying, your, your worst ever round that destroyed your hopes and dreams, that keeps you awake at night. <laughs> Killed me, yeah. Killed I me didn't actually inside. play that well. I've had rounds of golf where I felt I was playing much better, hitting further, you know, um, making better contact, and I've come off and I've counted up and thought, hang on. Yeah, that can be right. That 10 shots worse than 87 you hit? Yeah. And... Also, the, go the golf trip we go on, like I said, they range from s scratch to uh, 36. And probably the 36 handicappers are maybe a bit more than that. But So we've I've been on four trips, which is um, 12 matches. So it's three each. I've only lost once. Nice. And I've played, oh, yeah. against a, I've played against a range of different skill sets. And there's something that happens to me on that trip. And it's all mental. It's not. I don't start playing better. I've all my shots on that trip are over a hundred. Some yeah. of them well over a hundred. Something happens when I'm up against with f three other guys. I just wait for someone's head to drop, and that's when I feel match play is one of the most exhilarating things. <laughs> it's the best because you all hit bad. You're yeah. all hitting bad shots. You're all fluffing shots. You're all missing putts. It's about whose head dr goes first. Mm, correct. So it just becomes a case of, you know, I have my 10 seconds after the duff to have a bit of a swear at myself or whatever. But then, next shot Forget could be it, the best one. On. Stay loose. Yeah, That's what's good about match play. I do yeah. love that. I do. So they call me the postman. Because he always delivers. Always delivers. Right, so we've currently gone for about an hour and 10. So before we wrap this up, I think we need I, to... Sorry. Go on. Super quick one. Your 36 handicapper mate. Mm. What's your impressions of him? And nah, his that's golf? a good question. Well, so on the... Because he I'd, might feel nervous playing with you. I'd say there's four, and sometimes we have people on who might only have played a couple of rounds of golf, and we're playing on long courses. They, You know when someone just has an innate sportsman-like ability or sportsperson-like ability, which I do not have, this thing about... so just you being natural at everything. So you watch them and you think, yep, He's going to shoot 36, 40 over. He's going to lose. Next year, he is going to come back and he is going to be playing off 20. Mm -hmm. Then the year after that, he's going to come back. He's going to be off 12. Yeah. And that's pretty much the case. Oh, so that's, who, that's what you're they're seeing just, there. They're just people, you know, in their 30s and 40s, picking up a club going, okay, right, so this is a bit like what, that. What do like do? Watch a few YouTube videos yeah, and off you go. About six lessons. Couple of trips to drive range, suddenly 240 yards. Yeah, you get that. 250 yards. Yeah, I've got friends like that who used to play football, who now play golf, play a bit in the summer, could easily play to 14 handicap just because they've got that skill. But also, even the ones that don't, 
the worst it's going to be. That's your bad point noise now. That's my bad point <laughs> noise. This is this is the um, this is the lame lame take. But it's actually an ambulance for everybody listening. The worst I've I've had the worst that round of the Oxfordshire, and I could I looked at the scorecard this morning. I got a par on that round of 127. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. <laughs> as bad as that was. I, it, you know, it probably took us five hours to go around the four of us. No one was behind us, luckily. The course is beautiful. I hit a couple of good shots. Would I like to play that badly again? No. Was it the end of the world that I played that yeah. badly? No. Did the course look any less beautiful? Was the beer you still in the do 10,000 steps? Just and to, well, I did about 20,000 yeah. steps. <laughs> the, the clubhouse was just as nice. The Guinness tasted just as good. My friends were just as much, you know, nice Taking to be mic. around. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, worst case scenario, it's it's a nightmare, and you come off thinking, right, I'm never playing golf again. But then you wake up the next day and you think, okay, I can do better next time. Yeah. Exactly. So, as I said, I think we're about an hour and fifteen now, and it's it's flown by. But what I thought we had to do before we wrap this up is just get a bit more of a plug on bad golf. So, oh, thanks very um, much. Obviously, I've been watching a few of the videos before we spoke to him. We've actually had an eye because the first time I heard the channel, we did a video on how to stop bad golf. Well, I was and getting that, app messages yeah, going, oh, copyright. And people were like, no, they're like jokingly, but like, they, no, they're good guys. We're like, what are they about? So we found the channel and we saw it had about, at the time, 8,000 subscribers or whatever it was. Um, as we speak, you've got 9.45, so 9,500 subscribers. It's only been live a year, which I didn't realise. Oh, that's pretty good for yeah. a for a first year, and you've well, had nearly half a million channel views. Yeah, so we're at the minute what me and Alex were able to commit to for the first year is we'll film around each month us playing, and we'll put it out in two halves because he's so busy, mm -hmm. but he loves it. I'm less busy. I also love it, but I don't know anything about editing. <laughs> so we're kind of doing it all ourselves. We did the first round we've ever shot on an iPhone before, and we think that's going to make it easier. It, there were a few glitches, so apologies if there's just a couple of sort of visual glitches with there's a problem with the editing or whatever, but it still looks, re I think it looks really good. Um, the the dream is we get around a month plus another thing, either a challenge or an interview. So I'm going to chat to Rick later mm -hmm. and we're going to hopefully put that up on the channel. And we're going to have some comedian guests who also play golf. And yeah. We're going to play a couple of holes with them. So there's going to be more stuff on there. It's always going to be focused on the fun element. It's always going to be quite happy to revel in the fact that we're not very good. It's very relatable, isn't it? For, yeah, for golfers, it's not. We're not giving anyone advice about how to get better. Yeah, I, I like say, and, and it, and it even from your very, very first video, we've gone back in the archives. The introduction video is frigging hilarious. I love that. <laughs> like the way hi, I'm both, John Robbins. Hi, hi, hi John uh, I'm like Alex Horn. And they're like literally yeah, like shaking ages. hands for ages. It's like one of the funniest scenes. That's the you, first one I saw, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just so nice. Alex is a dear friend of mine and he lives just a couple of miles away from me. I mean, like I say, he's got Taskmaster, he's got a tour, he's got three wonderful kids, he's got a dog. Which I'm, that's where I'm saying, come on, mate, this is taking up too much of <laughs> your yeah, time. But much. He's, he's got a lot to do, but it's so important to us that once a month, minimum thing we do is we get out, we film ourselves playing around the golf. We have the competition, so I won't spoil who won the first year, but let's just say Alex got three shots after the first year and he is making hay with them. <laughs> <laughs> so what's kind of the, because what... Oh, and also, sorry, you can follow at Bad Golf on uh Twitter yep. and Instagram is I think at Bad Golf Channel, but we can link it might be the other way around. around. Sorry. So check it now. um obviously Yeah, Bad Golf Channel on Insta. It's like an entertaining channel. Um and from, from what I see, you know, the videos do well. You look, you've got quite a hardcore, engaged audience. But what would be... Because I, I, I love YouTube. Obviously, it's part of my job. I, I love to look at channels and understand more about them. What is kind of the... Is there any goals in place? Is it to, to make, obviously, you know, a living from it, essentially, in the future? Would that be a goal? Is it just as a side project? It I think, well, no, it was... Uh, I was talking to this to someone the other day. It will always... It will never be something we need to make a lot of money from. Mm -hmm. And that's a really nice place to be. 100%. <laughs> um, it would be nice yeah. to make a bit of money. It'd be nice to... And we do. We've been invited. We got invited to Glen Eagles to play Glen Eagles because, like a lot of those you know, really historic clubs, they want to show people 
Different anyone size. can yeah, play yeah. at Glen Eagles. Yeah. You've actually got a really nice niche to go to yeah. golf courses like that and from a, a bad golf perspective. And so I, I think if we could, if we got invited to play three or four really nice courses a year, like top level courses, just, just so that people can see someone, you know, at... Shooting the, 90s, going shoot, out, Shooting yeah. 90, but on one of the courses that you're used. So we, when we played Glen Eagles, it was getting set up for the Solheim Cup. The rough on the PGA course Horrendous. was out of this world. And I'd never played on rough like it. So your ball is in the rough, a foot in, you, don't you, you should it. pick yeah. that up and drop yeah. it because yeah. you, can't, you, you will not get out of that yeah, rough. Yeah. So it's fascinating as a golfer. And the Queen's course there is the most beautiful golf course I've ever played. Just absolutely stunning. And I didn't realize that that golf course was available to me. I assumed it was for mm. members. There'd be a two-year waiting list. It would cost, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pounds. What a place. And we got invited to play there. And, that, and that's, that was great. So that's all we really, I think, you know, as long as it's fun and we're getting the odd interesting Perk. experience. Yeah. And um, we have uh, been supported by Cobra. Yeah, I saw that. Who set me up with some new clubs. We're going to get fitted with them. Uh, for another set of new clubs next week, some new clothes and stuff. The people there are so lovely. That's really much in their ballpark, wanting to appeal mm -hmm, to yeah. a wider audience. A wider audience. The clubs are slightly cheaper. That's but one thing they've done very well. We've mentioned this on several podcasts and videos, but like the Cobra Driver, actually both got in the bag at the minute. So have I. Yeah, and it's just like the the price point they've hit at like three, four, nine for driver. It's still obviously not cheap. But compared to the competitors, it's much cheaper. Yeah, found a nice and I think niche. if they can keep that momentum over the next few years, it could could be big things. And like you said, you reviewed the new one by keeping at that price point. Clever. Really important. And you know, let's let's be honest. Three hundred forty nine quid is still an awful lot of money of course, for, a golf for one club. golf club. Yeah. But it's two hundred quid cheaper than competitors. Exactly. Yeah. And I don't think it's a bit like headphones. You know, the difference between. 10 pound set headphones and a 50 pound set headphones is massive. Mm -hmm. Difference between 50 pound set headphones, 110 pound set headphones, not yeah. much. Yeah. Difference between 110 and four grand, no one, no yeah. one knows that it's difference. ridiculous, isn't it? Um, yeah, th like I said, the channel's uh, great fun. One of the things with, how does it differ? Obviously you've done TV work, you've done stand up on stage, you know, how does it differ from your perspective of YouTube and the audience and the way you can create content? Does it give you a license to be as creative as you possibly want to be? Um, I mean, it's no coincidence that apart from us in this room, there are two other guys who have a skill set I don't have. One of them sat behind a computer, the other mm. one is sorting out the cameras, the audio equipment. Don't give away all our secrets. <laughs> but there is and this a, is on my own. <laughs> there is a team of people behind an awful lot of productions. Mm -hmm. on. I've been on, on a TV YouTube. show before in America and it was mind-blowing. Oh, yeah. Like I couldn't believe the amount of effort goes into every single so scene. We did. Um, I did a stand-up recording two days ago for uh, Calm, Campaign Against Living Misery, oh, yeah. in 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 conjunction with Dave. Yeah. So sort of a round table discussion about mental health and also doing stand up touching on mental health and sort of cutting between the two. There are four comics on that show. I would say in that room there were forty to fifty people working sixteen hour day to get that made, to get it edited, to I just I turn up they get me the coffee I ask for. They, give they, you, they bring me you some up. food. Yeah. They mic me up. They do my makeup. I will f forever be in awe of those people who are like, yeah, yeah, I'll go to, I'll go to Pre no, I'll go to Nando's, I'll go to Wagaman, whatever. Mm -hmm. Or, um, oh, if you just give me that T-shirt, I'm just going to press that T-shirt because you've just got a bit of a crease in it. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, that color doesn't match, so I'll pop out and get you a T-shirt that won't strobe on the cameras. Uh, oh, let's do a mic check. All these people with skill sets that are so far away from mine. So with YouTube, the the problem is that it's me and Alex are all those, those yeah, people. Yeah. So when stuff goes wrong, and like people comment saying, oh, I didn't think the quality of this one, or the sound's not really good. You're like, trust me, if I could work out why the sound yeah, was wrong exactly. on this video, so help me, <laughs> I would have <laughs> put it right. But that's what I love about YouTube. Can get well, away saw, with it. I, I mean, saw in your recent video you were sh showing off the boot function where you waft your app, waft your leg in front of the, of yeah, the yeah, boot, yeah. and like, it didn't work straight away. I was like, I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, it's real life, isn't it? It's real. It's, I love that. It's exciting <laughs> that you can just hold a camera in your hand and then 
12 hours work later for Alex and you I, I got my even, cup of tea in the morning and I'm watching the YouTube yeah. video God, but even then it's like you can turn it around even like the same day I used to do videos in the same day and it's like you, if you're documenting something and turn it around it can be raw it can be different it can be mm. you know unique and every round the golf that you play at every different golf course can be different and you know we try we really strive on ourselves now of trying to obviously excel the, the productivity now and make sure the videos are as good as they can possibly be and this is why the launch of the second channel where we can be a little bit more creative and a bit more raw and almost a bit more youtube -y. um but that's that's what i love about youtube and, it, and again when i went on tv it made me appreciate what takes place on tv but it actually made me appreciate youtube even more totally. so it's like everything's in control i can control everything i can see it i can manage it we a team of editors who we can draft it we can look through it we can upload it we can you know it's i think we need to me and alex need to get an editor or i need to bite the bullet and learn how to do this stuff because i'm a bit of a technophobe and yeah and, one, and once we do that i think we'll be able to get more stuff i think what's quite good though what you i know it's partly down to the fact you said you've not got the skill set but what is quite cool how you guys have come from like a tv background where you know how heavily produced things are but you have kept it quite raw because it could be quite easy for you guys to come in and think yeah get a, we need get this we need that we need the team. other we need the other but actually that gets lost certainly for smaller channels people want to see like rick said you not open the boot first time that rawness that realness and Obviously, editing would make it quicker turnaround for you, having an editor or whatever. But well, so we, have, we have used a couple of people, a friend of mine who's a video editor and a, a subscriber to the channel who offered to help us out with one when we just didn't have the time. And they were really good at sort of copying what style Alex had just mm -hmm. come up with out of nowhere. And I, we, I don't think we would ever want it to be like, Welcome to yeah. Bad Golf, <laughs> and all sort of <laughs> stuff Kelly going on. It's always nice. That it's this, you know, it's me and Alex arriving in our car in the same way that when everyone has ever played golf, you turn up in your car, yeah. you see him in the car park, you the boot scraper at the end, and yeah. you know, one of them's popping off for a wee. <laughs> <laughs> so the boot scraper, I like that. Yeah, and, and <clears throat> it is interesting. It is it's such a, a refreshing way of because again, like you say, with all the people you know in the industry, I'm sure it'd have been super easy to get someone on board and to you know the fact you're filming it on your phones and the audio sometimes isn't great and you get a few glitches. I, I really, it's nice. But it's then like also endearing. It's great to, ha to you know be able to meet you guys to play with you, hopefully play with other um, YouTube golfers in the future because. One thing that I noticed when I first started watching is when I was watching videos, I was searching how to break 90. I've watched every video about how to break 90 on YouTube. And so often, it's very, very, very good golfers pretending to not be very good at golf. Mm, yeah. Or going, right, so uh, see, uh, this, this tree's obscuring me, so if I want to break 90, what I need to do here is just, uh, is just chip out onto the, the fairway. And they do that, and, and then and I tried doing it, I can't Don't even do out. the thing yeah. they're saying. So hopefully maybe we can do some videos where there's good golfers and genuine bad golfers. So you can kind of almost be speaking to the mm -hmm. average golfer through us. Um, I'd love to see what difference it would make to have someone caddy me for a round to make every decision to see if that makes a difference to my score. Um, it'd be great. You know, one of the ideas we banked, I can't wait to do that. Yeah. I'm really excited to do that. To, to have a lesson in like, like we were saying, all the stuff that you don't get from mm. your local pro, you know, mentality, course management, how to how to play a shot you've never played before. Yeah. Because every game of golf, I'm in a well, almost every shot, I'm in a lie I've never had. You know, d not just downhill or uphill lies, but you know, wet ground. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Water around my boots or. <laughs> You'll see that a bit today on the <laughs> golf course because it's been super wet. So we're looking forward to sort of putting bad golfers in in places where usually people would have to sort of pretend to be playing as if they're playing bad. Yeah. yeah. And that's the, the only challenge with, from what I've seen, obviously being a golf professional, is that the advice that as much as you can pretend to be a, a bad golfer and show that it, the advice is, is genuine and it's statistically more, you know, measurable and, you know, there's been it's been proven to work sometimes when i've seen amateurs giving other amateurs advice i'm thinking i'm looking going it's not really oh. the right advice so it's kind of you've probably heard it a million times you lifted your head you swung too fast uh, there is it nothing worse like, there is nothing worse than playing around with someone who's giving you advice as you play yeah and he's a dear friend of mine charlie if you're listening stop it he was playing with me <laughs> at the oxfordshire 
And when I had those 21 bunker shots, he kept saying, fiber of sand, just take a fiber of sand. <laughs> and after the 13th bunker shot, you're thinking, if you tell me how to hit a bunker shot again, I'm going to just live in this bunker and I'm going to dig into this bunker and stay here. And you're going to you're going to come with me, yeah, Charlie. Yeah, yeah. Because, I'm going to dig a hole and I'm going to put you in it. Because I cannot, I am in the middle of something horrible right now. And you, like you were saying about the Open, if someone had come up to you, oh, no. who you're playing with and saying, what do you need to do, Rick? Um, you're just getting through the shot oh, no. a bit. You'd have gone, not now, mate. Yeah, I would have. Yeah. And that's the thing with, unfortunately, with advice from amateur golfers to other, other amateur golfers. It's been passed down through the ranks for many many years and often it's just not the right just cliches right. isn't it it's just so cliches and it's like it's hard to find that balance <clears throat> they're not doing it with any intent of harm no no they, not it's at all innocent yeah everyone wants it, to help yeah it just sometimes comes across like you say you're in a bunker for the 13th shot and you're thinking I'm trying to take a fiver of sand. Like, mm. It's not working right I now. I pay so many fivers <laughs> to get a fiver of sand right now. <laughs> um, it's brilliant. So I think um, we're going to go and film a video. It looks like it's staying dry. Um, the last thing we never did was went through Guy's bit <laughs> listener guy. of the week. <laughs> yeah, Guy. Well, I think we've got to give him a VIP for that. Well, he's, let's he's probably persevered. He's probably listened about an hour ago when we first mentioned his name. <laughs> he's like, any minute now, we can do my question. His question was to Rick... Would you rather achieve the status of the best YouTuber of all time, beating Logan Paul, Dude Perfect, all those guys, or win a European tour event? Become the biggest YouTuber in the world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think I would. I think my, 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 if you'd have asked me that five years ago, I'd have had a different answer. Mm -hmm. Asked me that three years ago, I'd have had a different answer. But <clears throat> I think I've become more aware now what, what I'm looking to yeah. be. I'm not trying to be a plain Just professional. Or probably the only bit of advice I will ever be able to give you, Rick, is now you're in a creative industry. You can't win. Yeah. And if you try to win at creating stuff, you'll drive yourself insane. We, it's so funny you say that because we're realizing that more and more and more. There is yeah. room for everyone. And if you are creating something, you can't lose. And that's the joy of being creative at stuff. If you, if you get into who's got the most subscribers, mm -hmm. oh, man. Yeah. yeah, I think it, the the only thing from a personal standpoint, it's I love creating. I'm addicted to creating, but I'm, I'm a, a bit like you're addicted to stats on a golf course. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm addicted to anal, anal you know, we yeah. both are. Yeah, and like, there's no depth you can go into. growth, and it's it's almost that. Not that I need the kids get me out of bed every morning, but if if literally the time when when I was like right, and it's, I'd be thinking right, well, the subscribers, the views, the the growth. Like I'm, I'm, I need to make content. But you're like, you're now in YouTube sense. You're on the tour. You've got your card. Possibly a lot yeah. of you've you've actually won a couple of matches. <laughs> <laughs> you're never yeah. you're never going to be Colin Montgomery. You've <laughs> you've got your name on the trophy. Yeah, it's, majors were Tiger wasn't playing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, maybe, next to it. yeah but like, <clears throat> I think I think that question going back to that question, European tour event. I mean, uh, not for one second am I am I. Um, saying that that's not an incredible achievement because it's ridiculous. The caliber of golf now that's yeah. on the top, I mean, it's unfriggin' believable. Um, I just feel like I'd win it and I'd be like, what's next? I'd have but to win I think more. As well, though, what's certainly changed, and we've probably changed this, and other creators have changed this, and you guys as well, is that three, two, three years ago, if you were a, a golf YouTuber, it was that you were a coaching pro and there was a lot of people were wanting to improve and get better. Whereas, you know, since the story of the 88s, 89s, you know, it's quite common knowledge now that yeah you're a, a golf pro by trade but you also are an online creator and that's where your passion lies it's yeah. okay you don't have to pretend you want to be a tour player because yeah. it's fine not to be a tour player you, you just have to put too much work in like the the workload to be a pro professional player to play at the best level is just we wouldn't we, this wouldn't be us now We'd, i'd be in a field somewhere shelling balls till i'm blue but, in the face but i also don't think most people know what golf pro means because mm -hmm. you, you, in my eyes you play golf for a living you do that now, you just happen to film it, you just happen to stop every so often and say, I'm doing this with my hand or yeah. I'm doing it with this new ball. Or You're still playing, you're still a professional golfer. Golf is your livelihood. There's, there's a yeah. separation now between golf professional and professional golfer. Mm. I'm a golf professional. Professional golfers are the guys out on tour. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So I'm a professional in the world of golf. I'm not a professional golfer. Yeah, professional golfer to me would imply that you're a professional actual golfer. golfer. But I see what you. you can I don't you get look paid for, even though I do get paid for play for hitting golf shots and giving advice. I don't get paid on my score, and I think that's the difference. If I got paid on my score, then I'd be a professional golfer. But it, I was chatting to my 
the guy who gives me lessons, Kyle Saggers, who plays at Wickham Heights in um, High Wickham, I said, Kyle, why don't you, you're obviously great at golf, why aren't you trying to be a professional golfer? And his answer was fascinating. He was like, yeah, I, I tried and I could do, you know, I've got the game to do it. I've played with people who've said, yeah, you're one of the best at striking the ball. But the cost of, of taking that leap, of putting in that work, it's a bit like Formula One. The people you see aren't necessarily the best. They're the ones who had money and backing yep. from age six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. And he was like, if I if I go to a tournament, I've got to pay into that tournament. That's a weekend. That's a hotel. Mm-hmm. That's transport. That's food. That's missing out on ten coaching lessons. So I'm I'm probably down net a grand. It's cost me. Yeah. Top prize in this tournament maybe four hundred quid. Mm-hmm. So if I want to lose six hundred quid, I have to win this tournament. Yeah. And if you've got a family and kids, there's no way you can take that risk. And I didn't realize that it's basically, well, he can play it because he's got sponsorship and um, this person can play it because their dad's really wealthy. Mm-hmm. This person can play it because their, their, their wife earns a load of money. So they've kind of got that, that give. They haven't got kids. You know, being a um, European tour professional isn't necessarily being the best golfer in, it's not being one of the 100 best golfers in Europe. It's being one of the 100,000 best golfers who had the backing, mm-hmm. who had the time, yep. who had the sort of other people were willing to let them do this. So. Yep. Oh, there's definitely golf. You know, if we looked at the thousand best golfers in the world right now, statistically, there can't be the best thousand people in the world because there would be golfers outside of that who are better. But like I said, just never had the opportunities. But also maybe ne- never the drive, you know, because it's pretty hard. Like I wouldn't, like say, want to be hitting balls all day, every day. You know, I'm in a different spot in my life now and family and everything else. But it's and it's such a ridiculous commitment like it's obscene and you've got to be unbelievably relentless and outrageously competitive and unapologetically you know ambitious almost do you subscribe to the you'd have to put this in do you subscribe to the athletic no so it's a new football yeah, a, yeah the football newspaper online. football newspaper online and they've basically poached all the best they've got journalists. the guy from liverpool um i can't think his name one of the guy big guy at liverpool echo he's now gone there but they also have golf correspondents. Okay. They have a long read interview with a golfer whose name I have now forgotten, but I read it and it was about what happens when all that struggle of playing and getting there, when you finally get there, how do you then motivate yourself when mm-hmm. you've spent years scraping and scrimping and suddenly you make 400 grand in a year? Yeah. And where does your motivation come from? And it was absolutely brilliant i'm intrigued to know what the golfer is english uh, player no american um because it is you know a lot of the tour players are the biggest professionals now and not they say they're not driven for money they're driven for wins and stuff they're driven for the i think lifestyle. once you get so successful like a rory or somebody it's down to wins and money and beating you being bigger than your mate in it yeah. if you've got a friend who's dustin johnson you want to wear more than him and yeah. win more than him you want the bigger house the bigger car the you know, whatever it may be. It's Joel Darman. Not heard of him. Uh, so the article's called Joel Darman and the discovery of what happens when you finally make it. So he's the correspo- He's the golf correspondent? No, he's the golfer. All oh, right. Um, and he's had a couple of sort of top 10 finishes. And it's basically his life story is really kind of up and down. Maybe one of those golfers that I should know, but I don't. I must admit, I don't. Joel Darman. And, but that's the thing with Maybe golf. Maybe probably did know him, wouldn't be. The so, article, much, so much money in it now that you can be a millionaire coming 40th. Yeah. yeah. Must be a very odd lifestyle, that. It might change soon. Um, but I'll, I'll forward you the Yeah, thing. sure. Cool. Uh, anyway, guys, thanks so much for listening. The laptop, your laptop on the floor is currently locked, so I don't know if it's still recording or not. I tried oh, to unlock it. it. I don't know the password. <clears throat> thanks so much for listening, everyone. Um, it's The password is don't shoot 88. You prat. <laughs> um, or oh, come on John you can shoot AJ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for listening guys thanks for watching on the second YouTube channel make sure you check out John on all of his platforms he makes some really cool videos one of my favourite creators new creators that have kind of burst onto the scene in the last year we're going to go out and shoot a video now uh, it looks actually quite bright so I'm looking forward to it um, thanks for listening make sure you subscribe make sure you rate the podcast go and check out John on his radio show Radio 5 Live Friday 1 till 3 Easy for you to say. Well, you did that better than I did. (laughs) (laughs) And we'll see you all soon. Thanks for being the first guest, John. Thank you so much for having me.